Reba Rini Rololio. Ei, Vahine Rololio, o elai. Maluna, o kina, o liolai. Eva hine holobio oelai, maluna okina uliolai. Ahelio hula haolelai, hauna holo eva luai. Ahelio hula haolelai. Yo, Tyler, this is Jeremiah. Um, I got this really crazy idea. I've been looking at this, like, world's biggest Strava segment, or world's toughest Strava segment, rather, a Mauna Kea. And um, an old road friend of mine, Alex, runs this touring company in uh, on the Big Island. And basically, he said there's an even tougher climb on the north side of the mountain. It's a scrabble climb that goes around this you know, backside of the volcano and then up the access road. And the crazy thing is he said that no one's ever done this thing. So I'm thinking we should do that. Um, give this thing a shot. If no one's ever done it, um, sure it'll be not just the world's toughest climb, but the world's toughest gravel climb. The first like mile and a half of this thing is actually a world ranked climb on that climbing website. So it's literally like this 20, percent grade like for a mile and a half so it's it's kind of the most ridiculous way to start give me a call back you know i think like on the road in good conditions you know you're looking at five and a half hours kind of set up um and so i would at least double that with the dirt stuff <laughs> All right. Yeah, so I would say it, it, to count at least nine plus hours from from YPO. Awesome. Well, it's getting it's getting even better. I imagine it's probably deep trail type stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's unimproved. It's not. It's not maintained. So, um, at least at least the middle section. Yeah. Yeah. The first the first kind of bit when you hit it, that's all maintained, but. Um, we just, you know, you get that big storm, some pretty heavy rains. Sounds good. And we might even make it to the top. <laughs> All right. Looking forward cool. to it. Awesome. Cool. Thanks, guys. Okay, right. guys. Bye. Cool. Okay. Thanks again. Okay. Bye. What makes a cycling route hard? First of all, you have the distance from point A to point B. Then you have how much climbing there is. We call this elevation gain. Then there's the average gradient. This is how steep the overall climb is. And then there's elevation peak. At sea level, the oxygen content is 21%. At 14,000 feet, it's only 12%. And then there's road surface. This is the terrain that you're riding on. So let's put this into context. Mount Ventoux, the hardest climb in the Tour de France, ranked 85th hardest climb in the world, 13 miles, 7% average gradient, 5,000 feet of climbing, and peaks out at over 6,000 feet of elevation. Mount Fuji, ranked 39th hardest climb in the world, at 18 miles, 7% average gradient, 6,700 feet of climbing, and just under 8,000 feet of elevation. These climbs, though, pale in comparison to the world's number two hardest climb. This is in Thailand, the Wuling Pass. At about 15 miles, a staggering 10% average gradient, with 7,855 feet of gain peaking out at just under 11,000 feet. And this brings us to the number one ranked hardest climb in the world, 
which is Mauna Kea, the volcano on the Big Island. That's 42 miles, 6% average gradient, with almost 14,000 feet of gain peaking out at just under 14,000 feet of elevation. Now those climbs are great and all, but they're full of road. The impossible route is 90% some of the most intense gravel you've ever had. At an insane 68 miles, with a total elevation gain of 17,500 feet, with a maximum elevation of 13,800 feet. With the combination of distance, elevation gain, terrain, and maximum elevation, this is the hardest cycling route in the world. No one has ever completed it before. Until now. Hey, I'm here to tell you about the story of climbing maybe the world's hardest cycling segment. It had never been done before by anyone. And Jeremiah Bishop, I don't know why he wanted to bring me out. <laughs> My feelings for Jeremiah Bishop really uh, were a big up and down throughout this whole thing. When he first initially called me and giving me an opportunity to go to Hawaii, it's like, yes. And then finding out more about the route, you know, my feelings towards him declined because <laughs> this, this was insane. Now, Jeremiah Bishop is a world-class rider. Skill-wise, world-class. Fitness, world-class. I am nowhere near his caliber. And to be honest, I wasn't training for some epic adventure like this at all. I was training for our 2020 race season. So I, I was pretty fit. Like I was coming in at the time when he gave me the call. I was uh, almost close to a five watt per kilo FTP, maybe like, like 4.8, 4.9. And I was confident, but the more he wanted to tell me about it, the more I didn't want to hear it. I didn't want to know all of the scary details. I just wanted to get on the bike and, and have them come at me as I was riding because I didn't want to freak myself out. I didn't want to psych myself out. I knew that my body could do this, but my mind is what would stop me. I needed to come into this, you know, deer in the headlights style and put myself in a situation where not finishing was not even an option. Okay, so what's the right bike? for this epic journey. I mean, obviously a road bike is gonna be very efficient once you get to the main volcano climb, but it basically would be impossible to run a road bike uh, with the gravel that we're gonna be going across. So then you almost lean towards a mountain bike for the gearing because the, the type of the, the steep pitches and the loose like lava rock is gonna be very difficult. So Canyon got Jeremiah and myself dialed in on a grail. top bar, like at the double bar, I've never really been a huge fan of that double bar, but during this adventure, I found myself on top of that thing more than, than any other part of the bar. I actually really fell in love with that weird double bar uh, during this, this attempt. What in the gear ratio out of the box was a th like the, the biggest was a 34 in the front and a 34 in the rear. But our guide, Alex, from Big Island Bike Tours, he was telling me that eh, I should probably run something bigger in the rear. And so Alex actually already had a, I think it was an 1140 cassette that we were able to get on there. I was really worried that it wasn't gonna be able to fit, but it fit on there, barely, it barely fit. But that was a, looking back, a huge lifesaver to be able to have to, to instead of a 3434 to go to 3440. What do you think? It's definitely maxed out. Okay. <laughs> um, it's not that bad though. I mean, the other idea is too, we could throw a derailleur on there. 
So stoked. Yeah. This was such a not gonna happen pipe dream that I'd just been putting off for like years. And to like <laughs> actually be here and to see the mountain. <coughs> is there a Strava segment for it? No, Barry Wicks was gonna do it last year and then we ran out of time and he was gonna come back and do it and then oh. the mountain got closed, so. Sorry, Barry. <laughs> Here's a question. How much issue do you have with people coming from like straight up dead sea level? To like 14. So like I've raced Breck Epic like five times. We've done a lot of these high altitude races. Yeah. And, you know, people are coming up from Denver and getting altitude sick. But I mean, like here, you're coming from like zero to hero level. You guys ever see any altitude sickness? Um, you know, I think that there's definitely the potential for that. Uh, you know, the, the, the physiological changes that happen are, are pretty hard for a lot of people. So. Um, you know, whether they're out of shape or just can't handle the altitude, it's kind of hard to tell, but there's not a lot of altitude sickness per se. Okay. Yeah. Waipu Valley. Yep. And then it heads from basically ocean level and it climbs up this, right? Yeah, that little dotted line. Got it. So starting from the ocean, we go up one of the steepest paved climbs in America. We then head on to basically the jungle, which is an extremely technical gravel road through the heart of the jungle. We hit Wyoming and turn into the farmland. The farmland consists of a brutal headwind. The gravel is not too technical at this point, but as you come around the base of the volcano, you start to get into much more technical gravel. The elevation pitches up and down as you hit steep, steep volcanic gravel climbs. This is where technical issues could be devastating. But as you get past this part, you connect back onto the main road up the volcano. This is where most people traverse this route. The road is steep, but once you hit the switchbacks past the visitor center, you hit another two miles of gravel. It's extremely steep and extremely technical. The last two switchbacks are absolutely brutal. Now if we zoom out, there's three ways to get to the top of the volcano. The way we're doing it, 68 miles, or the east approach, which Phil Guyman has, the KOM, under five hours. The west approach from Hilo, Levi has, under four hours and 30 minutes. You said objectively, this is the hardest route in the world. Yeah, and, and, according and where... to third party verification. Like, third party. I mean, you Barry know. Wicks is a, is a pretty important third party. He's a very important third party. <laughs> He's, yeah, multi-time uh, national mountain bike champion, one of my colleagues, as it were. Um, but yeah, there's this website called PJAM. It's like, uh, you know, sort of collects all this hill climb data from around the world. It gives a score based off of a French magazine that did like a scoring rate based off of steepness, duration, elevation, all these sort of factors give it points. Yeah. And uh, Monokea consistently just outbats everything in the world. I mean, you look at like Alptuez. I mean, this is like three times Alptuez. And it's in like- a single serving. Yeah, it's just in, in all in one shot. And I think length should be a factor in that, because I think what we're gonna find is that although it doesn't look as steep, this gravel route, I mean, between the terrain and the punches and the drops and like little punchy steep bits and the terrain, it's gonna um, really add up. Yeah. And then we're gonna hit the very hardest, like, what, two hours of the climb at the end. Maybe for you, yeah. It's gonna be like... <laughs> for the rest of the mankind, about six hours. <laughs> um, yeah. wh why is that, that section hard? Uh, well, I've just been looking at people's like Strava segments on it and the guy was like, yeah, four hours of mountain biking on drop bars is how he described it. You know, this guy's like, yeah, I started at sunrise and then I made it here and I was out, out of water for two hours and then I got to like to the access road and then I called my wife and he didn't even do the like extension to Monopoly. He didn't even do the hard part at yeah. all. Like, the so. The cross, Jeremy, the cross. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> going to be interesting, and I, I think uh, we're going to definitely yeah. feel it. The right side, the quote-unquote official um, yeah. world style that's, travel. That's but who we helped. We it's helped more of a those. road bike style hill climb with a dirt section. Um, so that one is, yeah, I mean, it's probably a little he less. Switched, we switched him to a gravel bike on it. Ah, that yeah. makes sense. And then he rode, yeah. he rode the gravel bike. and. But that seems a lot less interesting than this route. Oh, it's so much. This, this is, is so much be better, dude. Just beautiful. But so, 
this is where it connects? Yep, just above right the there. main road. Yeah, you should probably do something about um, the significance of starting in Whitefield Valley. So that was where like Kamehameha stationed a lot of his troops and lived for a long time. So it's, it's called Valley of the Kings. And, uh, uh, and it's, so it's got a lot of cultural and historic significance. And then what they call mana, you know, like you can feel that mana when you, Power. When you go into it. Yeah. yeah. When we went up to go scout it out, we actually ended up, you, you, there was a huge wind advisory for the top of Mauna Kea. They were calling for 110 mile an hour gusts at the top. And so, honestly, the the project was in major jeopardy. The World Trade Summit in Manikita is closed to the public at the Visitor Information Station and an elevation of 9,200 feet due to strong and gusty winds. The winds are sustained in the 60 to 80 mile per hour range and got up to 110 miles per hour range. There is ice and snow on the road above the 10,000 foot elevation and even in a dangerous threatening situation. The Monica Rangers will continue to monitor the wind conditions. Mahalo and have a nice day. You just don't think that there's that it's, it's paradise. There shouldn't be weather, but at fourteen thousand feet, there, dude, you're like in space. So we went up and started scouting the, you know, parts of the top and where we are gonna connect from the the gravel road onto the main road. It was extremely windy and very difficult to ride. We started to then after we scouted out and felt out our bikes and and had the whole bike setup dialed. We started to go uh, up, drive up a little bit, and it just wasn't, it was so windy, and it was getting late, uh, so we only went up to about 10,500 feet. What's so weird is, dude, I, I almost passed out. It was really strange, so I'm sitting in the car, and then all of a sudden, I'm feeling like I'm passing out. I'm like, this is not good. Why am I doing this? And uh, I had to kind of like lean my head against the, re the, the rest of the Jeep, and then, I sort of, like, I didn't go all the way out, but I was barely conscious. So that freaked me out, man, that only at 10,000 feet, and I hadn't really had, like, a crazy day, that I was already experiencing some major issues with elevation. So we get back to our house, and I start packing for the next night. <laughs> something that you can get like fluid in your chest or even like have your brain swell from like going all the way up to elevation and it's like what's what's what usually is the problem is going from super low to super high so not a big deal if you're like at 5,000 and go to 10,000 if you're at zero and go to 14,000 uh -huh. and I kind of freaked out about it now Food-wise, nutrition-wise, I'm really confident in my long endurance nutrition program. It's the same program that I've used for Climb to Kaiser, Belgian Waffle, Dirty Kanza, the Hammer Fondo. You know, really anything that's like six plus hours, that means a ton of beta fuel from science and sport. That means a lot of gels from science and sport. Because the gels from science sport, the, the, the viscosity is so thin, it's, it's almost like water. So it's very easy to go down. Uh, we have a full sack. So I'm able to, you know, have all the different water. Because there is no water on the route. There's nowhere to stop and refuel. So, again, you, 
to do this, you really need a sag. If you don't have a sag, and maybe that's something that we do later, we try to do like a self-supported version of this, but boy, that would be so, so difficult. I probably had something around 4,000 calories uh, that I packed that would be in, you know, in the Jeep with us. But the plan was to basically, again, just try to take in as much liquid calories as possible and then drink as much as possible uh, so that I can be hydrated all the way to the top. It's uh, 4.30 in the morning and I didn't sleep very well last night. I was like super, you know, just like before a big thing, right? You're just super nervous, just tossing and turning. I'd say I probably got like a solid two hours of sleep, which is not great, but it's just, what can you do? You know what I mean? I got in a bit early. I just couldn't, just couldn't get myself to go to sleep. Love you, babe. Love you. Oh, yep. Coming down to the beach, I was hit with a wave of realization I'm probably not going to finish this. For how difficult everything that I've seen so far, and then the first initial two miles of this freaking ride is like average 20%. So basically throw your pacing out the window just to stay upright, you're going to have to do 300, 400 watts. I got really nervous. I was confident going into it, but as we got down to the beach, which Boy, it was so beautiful. It was unreal down there. Uh, I, I was getting really scared. started pedaling dude and our shoes are soaked our shoes and socks are completely soaked with with ocean water so then it's like okay great and then Jeremiah goes on to give a pretty beautiful speech about what we're about to do you have to just look around and see this is one of the most beautiful places in the world uh, where you get to see the raw forces of nature in action and to start where the river meets the ocean and then the climb to the point at which all rivers start. I mean, that's just like powerful. And so I think we, uh, today we honor the place that we ride through, put in a good effort. Absolutely. Yeah, man. And now keep in mind, I'm with Alex, who's an Olympian, and with Jeremiah Bishop, who's a world-class pro. I mean, these two guys, you know, Alex had done the tour of California 12 years. I mean, I, I'm so out of my element, so I definitely don't want to let these guys down, right? I don't want to be the guy that everyone's waiting for, and it's like, God, we shouldn't have even brought him. So I'm really, really trying to make sure that I'm going to fit in here. Alex says, go, and we start. I clip in, and now I had all this sand in my cleat. So we start riding through the, the black beach sand, and I tried to turn right and the front end sinks, and I fall over in slow motion as I can't unclip. So I make it two or three pedal strokes and just slowly tip over onto the side. Which way are we going? Good. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. My one, my one. <laughs> I didn't even, I couldn't even make it three pedal strokes. 
into this without crashing. And I'm sure that these guys are just like, what did we do? Why did we bring him? I can't, this dude's such a squid, bro. Once you start and you get off the beach, the very first obstacle is the steepest paved road in America. And by paved, I mean, this is loosely calling it paved. The average over a mile and a half is over 20% with pitches like at 35%. Throw your pacing out the window, buddy. Cause as soon as you hit this thing, it is, and it's wet. It's like the road is wet, it's rough. It, I, I, the, on the first little switchback, I fell over again. I couldn't unclip cause of the sand. This first climb alone is, is a top 100 rated climb in the world. It was so steep so steep that you're actually getting an arm workout to just to hold yourself in position. back here. I think it's a 42, is it? No, it's a 40. All right, guys, mile two, down. The first, the first and first two miles, dude. I mean, it's beautiful. I'm running a 3440 and it's like, dude, I was probably doing 40 RPMs. I mean, max out my heart rate. Shit, dude. We're literally two miles into this thing. Okay, so here's the funny thing, right? Is like, we dipped our toes in the water and then the water came and anyway, I'm running road shoes. Bro, sand everywhere. So I can't unclip right now. I can't unclip and I've crashed twice. <laughs> the next big obstacle is the jungle. So this on the map is a public road. It's open to anyone. Uh, but when we got there, there was a gate you had to jump. Alex assured us that it is, it's, it's open, it's public land. It's not, we're not trespassing or anything. But we did have to jump this gate and there was wild boars like howling right next to us. It was so scary. No, I don't want to see him. There's some wild boars right there, dude. Howling. Your wild boars mess you up. Wild boars mess you up. Bro. The first two miles were so much. They were so much. We get to another gate, like where there's a little canal. And you could go left or right, and we're looking at on, you know, on the Wahoo on which way to go. And it says to go straight, but we're like, there's nothing straight. <laughs> there's, that's a jungle ahead of us. All right, so this ride is bound to have some snafus. Now the map here shows straight. Uh, but as you can see, we don't have the keys, but I think we're going back 
on a public property here, so it just needs to keep going up. But how do you jump that barbed wire? Uh, you go around it. Small deduction. To hang like this. this yep. Is, yep. This is kind of a strategy here. Got it. <laughs> There'll be a slight revision in the future for this route. That's why I told you to ride mountain bike shoes. <laughs> All good. Yeah, yeah. All good. This is like, uh, what is, uh, what are you, Tough Mudders or Adventure Races? Bro, I'm so stoked right now. So we get around this gate and we're going through, like, we're bushwhacking it. I mean, we are chopping our way through a legit Hawaiian jungle. I mean, it's not called the impossible route because it's easy. Yeah. Now it's starting to all make sense. You got it. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you gotta get me walking at least once. <laughs> it won't be the last time, I think. This, there was a road here at one point, but it's, it's like a four by four road. The, the gravel here is so marbly and there's like a rain rut down the middle. It was so technical. There's roots, like tree roots sticking out that are wet. It took, so much skill to just stay upright and a ton of power. Dude, yeah, I mean, okay, so, so far, part of this impossible, why it's impossible, is just straight, the legit skill level it takes to keep riding your bike, man. I mean, Jeremiah is world class. I am not. I am not world class. Ah! Whoa. World class. World class. I mean, hey. This shit is bonkers, bro. And I would say this was probably the hardest part of the ride, but at least it was in the beginning, right? So you're fresh and I, it was so beautiful. Like this is what you expect. If you're gonna come to Hawaii and ride gravel roads, this is exactly what I had expected. <laughs> The longer this ride goes on, the more I'm realizing why no one has done this before. But boy, am I motivated as a, as a son of a gun to get this done, dude. I mean, as of right now, I'm feeling really good, but that's probably a lot of adrenaline. And I really gotta try to pace myself. I kinda getting a little ahead of myself, kinda going on maybe, cause Jeremiah, Maybe I'm going a little too hard. I'm already cleared two bottles. I 
I've already cleared two bottles. So now 600 calories right there. Ah. We popped out on a real road. Uh, we're gonna hit this little town and then get back on the gravel and blow up the freaking volcano, dude. Insane. Now the farmland part is where you get to, I guess, let's say the south base of the volcano. And then you're gonna have to ride all the way around it to come back up it. And it, the wind is just a bustling. Like it is it, very difficult. The wind is brutal, dude. Can you hear that wind? So not only are you having to ride on the gravel, and so, you know, that's difficult, but then there's the wind. And I think at the time we started the farmland section, we, we had been riding for almost three hours, and I think we covered six miles. Six miles. That's how crazy the gravel and how steep all this stuff is. You're not, you're not traversing land very quickly. So you gone through two bottles? Mm-hmm. What are you drinking there, Jeremiah? Some goo. Some goo? Yeah. And some acclimate. acclimate. This altitude acclimation drink. I don't know if it does anything, but yeah, trying to top up with fluids is super important. So I'll make a couple pit stops like this and we'll really be thankful we did it later. Um, that road below Mud Road was just absolutely um, this is way harder than I thought it was going to be. And I thought it was going to be the toughest gravel climb or one of them in the world. Um, but yeah, it's uh, starting with that steep of a climb, my legs feel like uh, I went to the gym or ran like a 10K. Uh, but at the same time, it's absolutely spectacular. I mean, it's amazing to get to do something like this. Dream come true. It's just so awesome. All right, let's go. How would you uh, rate that headwind right now? It is blasting. Like, uh, it's gonna be pretty stiff here for a long while. And then hopefully as we get around the side of the mountain, more on the leeward or windward side, it'll be a little less actually. So me and Jeremiah are kind of, you know, trying to draft off each other, um, but the wind is just howling. It's, it's pretty cold, to be honest. It is a little overcast. And so, you know, we're throwing our vests on and we're just trucking along. The farmland part was very difficult mentally because you could see the volcano. You could see where you were headed. And, and that seemed so impossible, like, because you can see it. And it looks re relatively close, but you know it's not. And you know, you know, almost that you can see into time, right? It's very difficult, like um, for most rides, you don't see where you're gonna be six hours from now, seven hours from now. You don't see that. You just see the, the next turn or the next climb or whatever. So you can sort of like chunk it and be like, well, just make it to this part, just make it to this part. But the whole time on the farmland section, you see the freaking top of the volcano and you're just like, there's no way I'm gonna get to that. That's impossible. <laughs>
so windy for so long. Just non-stop wind, dude. I'm kinda over it. Over the wind, bro, I'm over the wind. And now again, at this point, I started freaking out uh, about the oxygen. Now I live at 3,500 feet and I routinely ride up to 8,000 feet of elevation. But where I live is covered in trees. So I don't know if it makes a difference about the oxygen content when there's so many trees producing oxygen, even though the pressure is low and, and, and you know the percentage of oxygen you're getting in is less. I wonder if it's different in a, in a mountain scene at 8,000 feet than it is in a desolate scene at 8,000 feet. Because around 6,000 feet, which isn't really that high, it, it, your body is starting to process and go, hey, we're not getting enough oxygen. And then you start to panic. There's literally a panic that sets in, uh, almost like snorkeling or scuba diving where you sort of freak out because the flow of oxygen isn't right. And so I was having a full on panic attack while riding. And so then I, I was trying to jokingly tell this to Jeremiah, like, it's kind of weird, right? Like the air sort of tastes weird. I don't know why I said it tastes weird. But in this farmland, there isn't really any trees. It's all just wide open spaces. And it's so windy that I guess you, you I mean, it just makes sense that maybe it's blowing any oxygen that's there away. <laughs> you know, I don't know. But I'm trying to like tell Jeremiah that I think I'm going to die. Uh, and so, you know, I'm like, oh, the, weird, the, the air tastes weird. And so then he says, yeah, it's, it's really something you gotta battle with. I've been battling with it for the last hour. You gotta just stay calm and you just gotta breathe normally and don't think about it. And I'm so glad that I asked him that because if he, ha if he was experiencing it, you know, then great. But if he wasn't experiencing it and I felt like alone in this feeling, I don't know, dude. I, I, I was like about to stop, to be honest. I was like freaking out that I couldn't breathe. And I felt like I was going to pass out. And then there's a sign at the top that's like, people die. And, and Jeremiah had already told me that like you can get brain aneurysms. And I was like, quickly going from a point of like, oh, this is just going to be a hard ride to, could, could I actually die? Is that a possibility? And yes, is the answer. Yes, there is a possibility of getting like a, a brain aneurysm uh, being this high. And then it's one thing to just go up to elevation, but then to be completely and utterly destroyed by the time you get there. So if it's 6,000 feet, I'm already having a panic attack because of the low level of oxygen, which 6,000 feet isn't that high. I ride at 6,000 feet all the time. It's never an issue whatsoever. I honestly think that I excel at riding at elevation. But for whatever reason, in this freaking farmland, I'm having a meltdown. But Jeremiah really kind of assured me that it was all good and we just kept trucking along. Right towards the end of the farmland section, you know, we had stopped a bunch to pee and uh, we, weren't, we weren't making good time. And so Jeremiah was like, hey, I, I gotta forge ahead here at this point and I, I wanna make sure that I make it before dark. And so he kind of takes off. Oh! Little chunky. It's getting mean! And I, I was totally fine with that. I told him, I knew, I'm gonna stick to my pace, I'm gonna stick to my course. I, I'm, I'm staying on my program. And what I learned from Dirty Kanza, which I'm so glad that I had that failure in Dirty Kanza, because the mindset of just keep pedaling and in an amount of time you'll be done, that was just ringing in my head all the whole time. Just keep pedaling. No matter how fast you're going, no matter how hard you're going, keep pedaling. This is the last section of gravel before we hit the volcano climb. And lava rock is so marbly and it's so loose that it is very, very difficult uh, to maintain your, your verticalness, to just stay upright. 
And the trails we were going up were very technical. And I'm having a real hard time just even making it up this. Uh, I mean, the amount of watts you're having to do to just stay upright is significant. And so we're something like six hours in, five, five, six hours in, and you're burning matches. You know, you're doing three, 400 watts just to get up some of these sections. We're halfway. We're halfway and we've, we've been riding for about five hours. So. But I have no nutrition, I'm like getting low, I'm out of water, I'm out of my gels, I'm out of all my, all my food that was on me. But I need to get to that Jeep, I need to refuel, I need to restock. I'm feeling really good though. Like, I mean, I'm happy, uh, I, I, I've got legs. Everything seems to be going really, really well at this point. And I'm thinking the whole time, all I gotta do is get to the volcano climb where I can get off this gravel, because bro, we've been on gravel all day. And uh, I mean, the bike had been handling it, no worries. So happy that I had that 40 on the rear, because I was using it the whole time. But I was done with the, the rattling of gravel, man. I was over it. Let me see some road. <laughs> like, I want to see roads so bad. And I'm thinking that once I get to the road, once I get to the, the volcano climb, that's when I'm going to uncork it. And Jeremiah is about an hour ahead of me. And I'm thinking that once I hit that climb, I'm going to stand and just start ripping. I'm going to make all this time up the volcano climb. That was the thought. Thank you.
long time to explain what just went down. By far, one of the craziest things I've ever done on a bike, ever. Did it, I made it, the impossible climb is possible. Don't make class limits for yourself. You can do anything. If I can do this. I'll tell you this, dude. If this bike blew up in flames right now, I'd be so pumped. <laughs> like if everything just broke at once. <sighs> I could have an excuse. Dude, this, I have 5,000 feet of climbing to climb right now. We've climbed 11,000. We're at 9,000 feet of elevation. Dude, my mind is like playing tricks on me, dude. I am in bad mental health. <laughs> I, I don't have any words. I'm gonna make it to the uh, visitor center and uh, I don't know if I can continue, dude. We're gonna drop down and see where Vegan cyclist is. Um, Tyler has got to be in just like the world of hurt. I mean, I think we'll catch him at the upper section, which is the worst section of the dirt climb. It is just absolutely a mind bender. I mean, this whole route is just like mental, just such such a challenge mentally. I just can't even put into words the different levels and emotions you go through. You're elated, you're flying, you got a tailwind, you've got three hours of headwind. I mean, that is just three hours into the wind, like just blasting it in your face. And then, um, you know, that course, that that start, the snake, this like climb up from Wapeo Valley, uh, it's just absolutely insane. You know, all these different emotions, you're, you're, you're kind of frustrated, you're kind of happy and then you go through a, I'm gonna make it the switchbacks miles and miles up I was like I'm not gonna make it I started to really really think I wasn't gonna make it um, I was lightheaded seeing spots dizzy um, I almost pulled over to sit down I mean I was really really having uh, some challenges out there um, and I, I consider myself really good at altitude and I've done some, I've won actually 10 big pro races above 10,000 feet. Um, so I have no idea what kind of condition we're gonna find Tyler in, but it's not gonna be pretty. Let me tell you that, I guarantee it. Now this sounds super hippie, but it's so weird that there is, who is this other thing inside of me talking? You know what I mean? Like when you're like, oh, I gotta wake up early. Then what is the other person going, nah, dude, just sleep in. And then you're fighting with yourself. Why do you have two, team up, right? <laughs> you don't get on the same page. Like if we both wanted to get to the top of the climb, then everything's good. But why is there a part, Where? why is there a persona hidden deep down that's just like negative Nelly? And he's winning right now. Can't let him. Not yet. <laughs> you know, look, I always often have tons of vegan excuses and I'm always, there's always some reason why I didn't uh, go to my full potential. Something that's always kind of just some weird fluke thing that's always seems to happen. This ride had zero vegan excuses. I have never ridden better my entire life. I paced wonderfully. I hydrated great. I fueled fantastic. Uh, I came in pretty fit. I mean, I was, I know my body could work. Uh, but towards this end bit, 
my mind was what I knew was going to stand in my way. And that's such a bummer, right? To be like, because it's my mind, dude. I should have control over my mind. You know, there's two, there's two beasts inside. And one is like, you got this. And the other one's like, no way, dude, you're going to die. It, but it's so weird that these two entities are in my own head. Why are, why are they not on the same page? Why do I have a part of me that wants success and another part of me that wants failure? And I just started getting so hippie, man, about how, why are there these two entities in me? Why am I having this battle within myself? I am me. I should be able to control both of these. I should be able to have those, the, the doubts in my mind just, dude, go away. I should be able to stop them. It's my brain, dude. I should have control over it. Is this what hypoxia looks like? And then I started thinking about how amazing Hawaii is and like that for all we know, there is no other place like this in the universe, right? That we are on this little blue marble that is so precious and, and there could n literally be nothing else that exists like this. And there could literally be within the span of billions of years, never be another time like this. I am getting hippie dude okay um just and so thinking about it on the on the cosmic scale of both time and space right this moment is so rare and that's the little seed that got planted while laying on the ground pretty much dying thinking man i i'm not gonna have another opportunity to do this and if you look out on the cosmic scale, the fact that I have the opportunity to climb up to the top of this volcano from an ocean, basically in paradise, when our planet's not a big ball of lava or, you know, there is no oxygen because it's raining iron, you know, like other planets, right? Like it was just, this is such a rare moment and such a, 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 a potentially something that doesn't even exist that I have to. Like I have to utilize this opportunity. And so I just said basically to myself, look, uh, one, I don't really want to post that I failed. Like that's a big thing, right? I don't want to make the post about how I, I didn't make it. And I knew that my body's going to do fine. I am crushing physically. My body has no issues. My knee is good. My, my, my fitness is good. My nutrition is good. My brain, my mind is what is shutting me down. So I just said, hey mind, fuck off. And I, I essentially astroplaned out of my physical form, dude. And I, what's weird is I don't really have a lot of memories from uh, the visitor center to the top, which was basically about two and a half hours. But I do, when I look back on it, it's, mo it's more like I filmed a guy do it than that I did it. Because I no longer was in my, my mind. I left. And so it was just one of those things where I, I took my, my, my consciousness and I put it in the future. Future me is going to be so much happier that I finish this. So just be future you. And I know it's like so much easier to say than it is to do, but maybe with the low oxygen, I did it. And so I got back on the bike and I started riding. this is the last two hours I ever have to ride a bike and of course I'm gonna ride a bike again but in this moment I'm lying to myself dude that I just dude just right just put out two more hours and you can be done forever
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Top of the world. I honestly don't like remember anything. <laughs> like my whole life is all condensed to just this one moment. <laughs> you know what I mean? Ah, oh, so sweet. I really wanted to cry at the top, but I am just void of yeah. fluids and emotion. I mean, this is just one of those things that just, it'll take a lot of time to sink in. I mean, just nothing has been done like this. Why well, PO? Yeah. World's first for the impossible hill climb. Uh, I thought really it was impossible for a few times there. Oh, like, no, really impossible. That was unbelievable. Yes. Made it. To be basically on top of the world, uh, to see the sunset through the clouds, and I just remember like glancing at it and it being so unbelievably beautiful and i just go wow that's some spiritual ass shit where's the jeep let's go home <laughs> like that i i that was it that was all i had it's hard to explain it there's just no words for what this was and for how many times i was a hundred percent certain your boy's not finishing and <clears throat> Like, this is one of those things where it's like, you just need a team around you. And I, <clears throat> I honestly wanted the bike to explode into pieces and then I'd have an excuse uh, to not finish. But it just kept trucking along. And, uh, and then you like, you can't stop when everyone's put all this time and energy. Like how dumb to get one mile from the top and be like, I'm, I'm it, that's it, <laughs> let's go home. But. I mean, we honestly made it within like a one, maybe maybe a five minute window, right? Like yeah, five minutes. The drive down, again, I just, I couldn't really process what had just happened. It was so beyond my physical capability, so beyond my technical skill set. Um, and again, like I said, I just, I, I had to push my brain out, my consciousness out of my brain. And so it was very similar to have, have watched someone be successful versus be that person. So there wasn't, I, I wanted to cry at the top. I was hoping that I'd get to the top and I'd cry and it'd be this really cool shot. I was devoid of any emotions. There was no emotions whatsoever. There was no like, yes, whoa. It was just that, I, just nothing, dead inside, which is kind of a bummer, right? I mean, for, for how epic this was. It's impossible though to really tell you what it was like because of the elevation, of the terrain, of the distance, of the time, of the intensity, like everything that makes something difficult, this is all set to nine out of 10, right? Elevation probably 10 out of 10, but it's just, there isn't anything about this route that is easy. And it takes a full range of skill set to be able to get it done. Now, right now she's a little haggard I think she's beautiful, okay? But we are in the midst of this crazy corona thing, and so our kids are home, and, and she's been full gas with the kids. Let's scoot over a little bit. So, um, you know, she just wants you to know. She's that not. These are the clothes that I slept in, and my hair is not done. Okay. She's not even trying. So if you think she's pretty, <laughs> you should wait till she gets right. That's so dumb. <laughs> so t tell me from an outsider point of view, which you don't. You didn't go to the top, you just, we, we would drive and you would see the top of the volcano way off in there at the distance. What do you think, and you know me, and, and how I'm just a, a normal whatever, not anything special. So me finishing this and completing this, being the second person ever to, to, to do this route, how does that make you feel towards me or what is your thoughts on it? Um, 
it's definitely hard to believe like the size of the volcano when you compare it to our mountains it's really crazy to think that you did that but then it's also neat because it's just something a life goal that you accomplished I'm sure I have life goals that will never be accomplished I have like the simple goals of have a family and have kids that most people accomplish but you have this goal that you accomplish that how many people will in their life you know what I mean so does it make you jealous no, I definitely don't want to climb a mountain on a bike, so hell no, it doesn't make me jealous. But I, I mean more of like that I got to, to, to no. realize a, a life, not that this was like a life achievement that I thought about all the time, but right. to, to, to like put that badge on me, you know what I mean? No, it doesn't make me jealous because it makes me feel like that we did something together. I mean, I didn't achieve anything, but you did and that's good enough for me. Get yourself a good girl like her. Thank you. A huge shout out to Whoop. Whoop actually has helped me uh, choose the day because we had about a week. We had about 10 days we could have done this in. And Whoop was able to show me when I was going to be at my best. Now, I didn't really talk about this, but the travel to Hawaii from, from Bass Lake, disaster, an absolute disaster. We had our two kids with us, our little two-year-old. Uh, we got to the airport at five in the morning. It was delayed for fog, which me we meant we missed our connection, which meant layovers, which meant we actually had to change the destination of where we were flying to. Uh, Ubers and, and, oh my goodness, it, I can't, it's, I could do a whole video on the travel disaster that was. Um, and so what ended up happening is that after about an 18 hour travel day, I could see on my whoop, my recovery so low. And it actually took three full days before my recovery came back up. And on Thursday, the day we rode was the best that I had been feeling according to whoop in the last like two weeks. So I was really able to use, actually use like data is one thing to be cool to look at in past to like look back on. But the fact that I was able to predict good fitness via the WHOOP and not just through training peaks on like power or heart rate, this was overall stresses. Because essentially, according to my training peaks, my travel day was a recovery day. Psych, it was a recovery day, dude. You want to be with a two-year-old screaming on three different airplanes out the whole day? She just said, she just said, sorry. So, huge thanks to WHOOP, man. I can't believe, I can't believe I did it. I can't believe we did it. You, you helped me do it. Because without you, I would have quit. If I could have just had only me know that I quit, that'd have been fine. But for me to have to tell you that I quit, not gonna happen. Stay safe guys, and as always, vegan cyclist. You. Yeah. Thank you.